So this is a, 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 our center, a Center for <coughs> Entrepreneurial Development at IBA Karachi. And IB is a business school is like 60 years old. It's like the IIMs of India, the IIM in Ahmedabad, Bangalore. So yeah. It's like 60 years old. And uh, so this, the center was started like 10 years ago. And uh, once again, we started our journey with the causal lens, actually. We went with that, the causal lens. We were looking for, uh, we were targeting top school, edge people from top schools, business planning and connecting to banks. And uh, we approached Babson. Uh, we had a lot of friends there. So we got training from that side as well. So we started with that uh, causal lens. Uh, but very soon in two years, we figured out that uh, it's not working uh, because in the Pakistani context, um, people, nobody would, could get a loan and all those business plannings were just waiting and they couldn't start. So it was in 2012, it was an accident or a chance that by that time I had attended uh, your presentations in the academy and uh, in, in Pennsylvania, in Vancouver, uh, you know, in Pennsylvania. Uh, so, uh, and I, I really, it just gelled into me and it felt that it's close to my heart. And we started experimenting. And one fine day we got a telephone from the daughter of the chief minister. And she said that, uh, hey gentlemen, you're always targeting the elite and making rich richer. There's a lot of people in Sen in Karachi. Why don't you do something for them? They have degrees, but they can't, they, they can't find a job. They can't do anything. So we designed a four month course, Saras, it was in 2012. And it was based on the simple principles of effectuation. And a miracle happened. The miracle happened was that these people could not speak English very well. They were, they were simple dressed. And after three, four months, they were making like $100, $50, $200. And $100 and $50 is, seems to be small, but uh, you see, it's, it's a big jump, I would say. It, it, it helps you discover who you are. So it was 2012 when we started formally using effectuation and we embedded our own local indigenous material into that, uh, our own local poetry, local wisdom coming in. And uh, that's why where we started dreaming that one day uh, we would sometime meet Saris. So if we look at the, if we look at the two lens, the, the causal lens, uh, the center had a plan. We, we developed a plan in 2010. And the plan was, the causal lens was asking for $7.5 million. That we will be needing $7.5 million. We will be hiring a lot of people. We'll be making a building, collaborating with Babson, training 38 employees. All these things will be done with the $7.5 million. And you know what actually happened after 10 years? Much more has happened with less than point, when we follow the effectuation approach. So this is a very interesting case that uh, when, we when we went through the effectuation approach, uh, it, it, we have done much more actually. We have done with such a parsimonious way and a creative way and in a way to way and the people will speak of themselves today. So this is one of the, Karachi is here on the, on the south side and our outreach went all over. The president of our university, he is the advisor to the prime minister now. And at that time, he was the ex-World Bank and the governor of the state bank. And he said that whatever experiment you do, I would like you to share it with others. So the beauty with effectuation is that this is natural, it's organic. And people in these cities, it has mentioned, it, it was just a heart-to-heart -heart transfer of, of love and affection, and it, it, it is, I think, um, it, it's, it's, it's not, not just knowledge, it's, it's love, it's passion transferring from one place to another. And people started doing wonderful things. So this is what we do. We have a small, it's much smaller than uh, the effort which you make, but we have a VB MBA program, and what we focus on family and agriculture and entrepreneurship. So this center has, uh, you see, trained like 100 faculty members on effectuation. Uh, they have gone through three days and five days workshop. On the research side, we are a bit low, but still we have done GEM research for three years. We have like 60 small cases on effectuation based, uh, you see, in Urdu and English. Uh, so th these are like women entrepreneurship, but we do small cases, three pages, five pages. And now we are doing PowerPoint cases. 
just a PowerPoint case. And this is, an, then we have a small incubator. There are like 80 companies now. And these people who get training through our center, they come to the incubator. And then gradually we started doing uh, small, you see guest speakers, small business plan competitions. But these business plan competitions were causal in the beginning, 20, 10, 11, 12. Then we, we have gone into effectual business plan competitions. That means that it's a six month window. You don't do it right away. You, you do start doing something, find your bird in hand and share your bird in hand in a presentation. So it's, and then we went to outreach activities. That is something interesting. We had a woman entrepreneurship program. Then we moved toward mother's entrepreneurship program. Like the scheme, she, she can't spend three, four hours, more than three, four hours. But as a mother, she, she is taking care of her kids and her husband. Her, her husband is a surgeon. So she is taking care of the whole family. So that itself is entrepreneurial. She is, she is doing multitasking. So we should need to recognize uh, the women of Pakistan uh, that they are different. So we have vocational entrepreneurship, class 10 people and kids entrepreneurship, class 9, 10, 11, when they are on vacations, they are invited to. So these are some quick, uh, uh, we have still three, four minutes. So these are some pictures. These are uh, ex-president and these are women entrepreneurship. We celebrate. These women spend four months with us, twice a day in a week, Friday evening, sometimes Saturdays. So the opportunity cost is low for them. And it's incredible. This, the knowledge and the, the interest which we find in them is much more than our traditional MBAs. And then we, we uh, Saris, we eventually went for international summer school in effectuation. It is happening for five years. People from Germany, Europe, and few people from Mexico, Brazil have been joining us. So this is something very interesting. And if you had visited us in June, maybe you could have find some, found some people. So it was very challenging to bring foreigners to Pakistan, uh, but uh, effectuation made them come here. Effectuation, Pakistani version, uh, was interesting for them. And the hospitality. And this is the agriculture entrepreneurship program, Fisher, cotton, mangoes, so anything which is natural, which is close to your burden and people can start rather than. So the scheme gave me an idea along with my team uh, as Corona came in, that Sir Shaheed, why don't we start an online program? So two, just one, one and a half month ago, we designed an online entrepreneurial mindset based on effectuation course. So this is a 40 hours course. We have designed it for free to anybody who can register. Anybody, anywhere in the globe, you can attend this course. It's in two languages, English and Urdu. We have an LMS and people can have access to it and they can see the videos, the, the recorded things and materials. And there are some premium uh, options in which uh, they can join our Zoom online sessions. So in this course, we have people from all over the world and uh, around 3000 students, 330 countries. So your, 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 this talk today will, will hopefully reach, uh, recorded uh, will reach to a lot of people. So from Pakistan map, you see a lot of people. This place is very less populated. So this is almost empty, Balochistan. So the population of the whole country is uh, hopefully will be having access to your sessions. And the, they are, I think, almost already aware about the word effectuation. So they will be very, I think, interesting to hear. They will be very, they will love hearing from you because as original founder, it will be something interesting. So this is a, a quick, this was a quick uh, uh, introduction to uh, our team and let, this is our inside, uh, our library at CD. This is a typical classroom scene of the center. And uh, this is, uh, we just highlighted that you'll be talking. And this is our team, Azad, Imran, Israr, and Talha, Abdullah. And this is uh, Neha. Misba and Tuskeen. So this is a, a mix. And then we have a lot of visiting faculty uh, who come on. So with this, uh, I would like now, I think it's almost still. Uh, so a lot of people have been coming in. So uh, just to highlight Gohar from Gujanawala is like 1000 kilometers there. So people from Gujanawala is like 1000 kilometer. It's near Lahore, they are there. 
Sadaf Tahir Sahiba is excited. She's a woman entrepreneur, mother entrepreneur, Mubashir from New Zealand. So we have people from New Zealand listening to you. And so 61 participants are there. And in, in one, two minutes, I think Sarah can start. Does our team have any question? Abdullah, Taskin, Neha, anybody has any comments? Any thank you note to Sarah? We will do it at, at the end as well. But our team was really excited. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, my name is Azad Ahmed. Uh, nice and to meet I, you, Azad. Yeah, nice to meet you too. And I would like to really thank you because we have been talking about uh, evacuation and I think there is no any day where we do not talk about evacuation and Sara Saraswati. So it is <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So it is very exciting day for us that we are listening to you live. Thank you very much. <laughs> it's yeah, also my honor and my pleasure. Uh, yeah. And I always say this that, uh, you know, some of it you can give me credit, but most of it uh, is credit to people like uh, uh, Shahid who have actually taken the idea and moved it to another level altogether. I just get the credit for everything that uh, people do. So uh, I, I, I'm just blessed. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, and I, I am excited. I'm very, I was very disappointed uh, that we had to cancel my visit. And I, I still hope one of these days to come to Karachi in person. Uh, I, I was very, very excited. Uh, and then, uh, the, uh, you know, this thing happened. But hopefully in the future, we will get to see each other as well. Yeah, we, um, we will be looking forward to welcome, welcome you at Karachi. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, so uh, sh should I get started or... Um, uh, I think Should I get started? Yes, yes you can start. Okay. Uh, so I'm assuming this is so I just wanted to say uh, it's evening uh, in Pakistan. I, I'm not like fluent in Urdu, but I think it's one of the absolutely most beautiful language on earth. So I want to attempt at least to say Salaam Alaikum. Uh, and uh, welcome to my uh, home. Uh, one of the disadvantages of COVID is that I cannot be there in person, but one of the advantages is in a way you can be in my home and I'm in your home in some ways. So uh, it's very interesting uh, how we are learning about each other. So uh, welcome. Uh, and um, since uh, everybody here, I mean, I really uh, would suggest that your real educator here should be Dr. Sharid Qureshi. Uh, but uh, uh, all I'm uh, trying to do is to share with you a little bit about where the, uh, the, the idea came from uh, and also whatever it is that I have learned uh, over the last 20 years of uh, trying to work with educators around the world, but also trying to educate entrepreneurs and other people, uh, myself in my classrooms and things like that. So it's been, uh, uh, it's been wonderful to be part of it. Um, as we get started, I want to uh, say two things. One is I would like to keep this as interactive as possible. Um, and even as a student, I never enjoyed straight lectures that much. Yeah. Uh, so I don't want to be lecturing, even though with this technology, it's much more difficult to be completely interactive. But uh, I have discovered that uh, Zoom can be more interactive than people think it is. And in connection with that, I would like um, the IBA team, Taskeen or whoever, if you can keep an eye on both the participants and the chat window, feel free to yeah. interrupt me in between anytime you want. Uh, uh, you can just simply, I will keep the participant window open. You can raise your hand. But simple, the simplest thing would be you just butt in and say yes. there is a question in the chat window. Maybe we should address that right now. Uh, and throughout the presentation as well, I will break in between and say, do you have any questions? So it will not be one long presentation. Uh, that's the way I want it to be. And I did create uh, 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 like an actual uh, set of slides, but it's fine if we don't get to all the slides because you will learn through the rest of the course anyway. So we will go where we need to go. And I would rather keep it very interactive. So. Um, uh, if there are no second? procedural questions, I will get started. If there are any procedural I, questions, now is the time. Can to I get them. a quick uh, one minute, well, half a minute to get a poll from them from which part of the country they're coming from? 
so, ah, so sure. we can get a more picture. Sure, so, sure. Ladies and gentlemen, can you please uh, uh, fill in, just go to the poll. Where, where, where do you belong to? Which program you're coming from? The MBA program, the online program, the certificate program, the woman program, the Oxfam program, the NEP, IBA faculty, other faculty, national guests, international guests, just to have a quick overview so that Saris can maybe, uh, she can customize a bit maybe if possible. So you, you can have an understanding where are you coming from? Yeah. So there's some and MBA whether I customize or not, you can just ask questions, very specific exactly. questions. So that will make me think about your situation. So no problem exactly. with that. So they'll have, so, the certificate and entrepreneur program are the entrepreneurs, Sarah. Yeah. These are those people who are already doing something and yeah. they're taking our courses. The 32 person, the online course. Yeah, the I can see that. Then we have the, yes, yeah, you can see that. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. It's, it's very interesting. Um, so there are person. real entrepreneurs, students of uh, entrepreneurial mindset, uh, and also like the MBA class. So, so that's like the bigger uh, group. Um, exactly. And then... Uh, um, a special welcome to women and mothers, of course, exactly. uh, and hopefully we we'll touch on social entrepreneurship as well. So the Oxfam uh, might be interested exactly. in that. So um, we are working with the, in, in yeah. villages as well with the help yeah, of yeah, Oxfam. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then the faculty, educators are, uh, yeah. you know, my They will tribe. be joining and in, I think it's uh, in a few more minutes. Uh, we are expecting 117 members have joined us. My dear fr friends, can you quickly do 82 have done so that we can proceed further and uh, then I will be sharing with you. So we have some people coming from 90% from Pakistan, uh, from New Zealand, some Dubai, Australia and others. Yes. So, uh, so I think uh, people, some people will be joining us as well. So I think... Uh, I think somebody was trying to say something. Yeah. Okay, so I will be just ending and then handing over to, uh, to so these are like 122. Yeah. Uh, Abdullah and I think people will, uh, a few people might still be coming in. That always happens. Okay, yeah, so. Okay, so over to you. Okay, so I will be sharing the results with everybody. So these are the sort of results which you can see. And uh, most of them are uh, from the MBA class online course certificate. So thank you very much and over to Saris. <laughs> thank you. Um, so uh, in, in terms of, I, I think everybody already knows Zoom etiquette, but I always repeat it, uh, you know, keep your um, uh, mics muted. Uh, until you want to speak and then you can always unmute and speak and you can raise hands. I'm, uh, I've already requested the team at IBA to keep an eye out if somebody <laughs> raises a hand and the chat box and uh, the team has complete uh, freedom to interrupt me anytime. Uh, and for the rest of the people I'll offer, I'll, uh, I'll stop in between and ask for some questions as well. So we'll have all these different ways of uh, interacting. Um, and uh, so one of the things in terms of asking questions on Zoom, what happens is uh, somebody raises a hand and we go to them and then somebody else. So there is a whole like seven people raising their hands. And then somebody, when the first person speaks, somebody wants to add to what that pers person is speaking. So the, in my classes, what I do is I say, anybody who wants to make a point, raise your hand. And if somebody is making a point and you want to add to that, then click on the yes button so that uh, uh, any particular topic of conversation gets exhausted. And then when I go to the next raised hand, it's a new topic, right? Uh, and that is uh, just, just sharing these with you. It doesn't matter if, if it uh, doesn't work out that way. Okay, I'll get started here. Let me share my screen. Uh, every once in a while when I'm sharing my screen because I cannot always see everything, I will ask you if you, if I, I might ask you a question and say, can you see it and just do thumbs up so that I can see in the windows that you can see it. So let me share the screen and uh, you should be, so everybody can see it. Yes. Yes, thumbs up. 
Thumbs up. Okay, <laughs> great. Um, and uh, doesn't matter if something goes wrong with the technology, we'll figure it out as well. Okay, so uh, you already know the word effectual, so that should not be come as a surprise. Um, so, uh, oh, sorry, that was not where I was supposed to start. So the conventional wisdom uh, uh, is where we begin, right? The conventional wisdom when you read a lot of like newspapers or media or something like that. And sometimes even successful entrepreneurs, when they come and talk in class or something, uh, there is this myth out there that this is how entrepreneurship absent, uh, happens. That you have to first come up with a brilliant idea uh, and then you have to show there is a very large market for it, right? Uh, and then, uh, you know, assuming you have a brilliant idea with a large market, then you go and, you know, write a business plan, uh, preferably a winning business plan. And then you go out and raise money, of course, hopefully you raise lots of money. Uh, and then you go off and, you know, build and grow the venture. So this, this step by step idea has been around for a long time, and it continues to be around uh, to some extent. Then of course, after you build and grow the venture, like you will go public or you sell. And I always joke about it. Now, what do you do if you have gone public and you have sold the company? Uh, and of course, people will give a variety of answers, but the dream is of course, you go off to the Bahamas, right? Uh, so people have this idea that this is how entrepreneurship happens. And you know, uh, one thing about conventional wisdom, conventional wisdom is usually wrong, right? It doesn't work that way. Um, so uh, having been an entrepreneur myself, I've, I have co-founded five ventures before I came into academia. I knew not only that this doesn't work out this way, I also knew that there is a lot of like mysticism about entrepreneurship, right? Like that it is only those very special people can do it or it is all about making money or, you know, there are all these. Um, and uh, I came into academia with the idea of saying a lot of entrepreneurs are going out there and learning the same lessons over and over again the hard way. Uh, and I wanted to say, of course, we cannot teach everything that life can teach you. Uh, we cannot teach that in a classroom, but there are very many more things that you can actually learn uh, through a systematic course that can help you cut short a lot of the difficulties that a lot of entrepreneurs go through. And that is why when I came into academy, academia, I wanted to have a very practical question. But now, uh, because of my good fortune, I get to go to different countries and meet different groups of entrepreneurs or at least people who want to be entrepreneurs, right? Entrepreneurs has also become very, entrepreneurship has become cool and sexy now. Uh, but everywhere we go, uh, I get this kind of a thing, right? People will say, I want to be an entrepreneur, but, and uh, if you were in the room with me, I would actually make it much more interactive. But given the time we have, I'm just going to keep going. A lot of people will say, in fact, in the chat box, you can enter. Uh, what do you think the answers would be? Around the world, what do people actually say? I want to be an entrepreneur, but... Uh, so enter that into the chat box. Uh, uh, and uh, I want to make sure I can actually see the chat box. Give me one second here. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can see that the, uh, the answers are very similar. Uh, so people will say things like, I don't have an idea. Uh, and what they mean is I don't have a new to the world brilliant idea, right? Uh, most of my ideas are really mundane. That's what they really mean. So I don't have an idea. I don't have money or I don't have time. I don't have other resources. Uh, then, of course, this is a very big one. I'm afraid to fail, right? I mean, uh, the entrepreneurship is very risky and I'm not a risk taker, that kind of thing. And then the last one, of course, is I don't know what to do. Um, uh, and uh, you hopefully you will see that the lessons uh, that we bring you from the experiences of expert entrepreneurs uh, will answer all of these questions, but they're going to get, answer you in a rather surprising way. So let's take a look at that. Um, so, so when I came into academia, my, uh, my interest was in, uh, is really looking at if you have been an entrepreneur, for years and years and years, you, you have spent full time starting and running companies. 
and you've started multiple ventures and taken at least one company public, which means you have lots of immersive experience in the domain and you have also shown uh, performance, but you have been through every possible experience, not just, not only successes, but also failures and successes. What is it that I can learn from you that I can also teach in a classroom? This was my PhD research question. Uh, I was very fortunate. I was at Carnegie Mellon University and I got to do a study using a method called Think Aloud Verbal Protocols. Uh, what it does is, uh, so I'll explain that. I know it sounds like a very uh, complicated scientific method, but in actual fact, it's rather simple to do, but a little complex to analyze. So uh, the idea here is, uh, uh, suppose I ask you to multiply, and so basically I'm going to ask you to think aloud while you do something that you know how to do. So if I ask you to multiply 24 by 32, and I tell you no pen, no pencil, no paper, and you have to talk continuously as you do it, uh, very quickly, it's not about whether you know how to do arithmetic, right? That I will be able to see how you do arithmetic. And the interesting thing is I can even tell you where you went to school and when, because different schools teach arithmetic differently and have taught differently at different points in time. So that's the method I used on the expert entrepreneurs. I created a 17 page problem set of 10 typical decisions that happen in all startups. And I had all these experts who had built companies in many, many different industries. I had them all thinking aloud, right? Talking aloud as they were solving the 17 page problem set. So now I got the data from all these people, uh, they are, but they're all solving exactly the same problem. So that gave me uh, the, the root of the research that something that you can actually compare and analyze. Since then, we have written uh, over 200 case studies for, uh, from, uh, and there, is re there are researchers from 54 countries. The last time we counted, uh, there are about 700 papers published, things like that. So this is why I say, I am very fortunate to have done the original piece of research, but it's only like a piece of research. Uh, and a lot of what I bring you comes from uh, people around the world who have uh, helped us do this thing. So very grateful for that. And I do, you know, I say, okay, it's good fortune. And I sort of enjoy my good fortune, I guess. Uh, so let's get to the finding. So the key finding here is this, a lot of what we teach uh, in schools in general, but business schools in particular, has to do with something we call causal logic. Where what we're trying to do is we're trying to teach you when you are faced with uncertainty, when the future is unpredictable, let's try and predict better, right? Let's try. So for example, in deciding, you know, what product to build, we actually do uh, like a strategic analysis and come up with like gaps in the market um, uh, or uh, in marketing, we try to look for, you know, which segment is most likely to pay the most, to have the least risks and grow the fastest, right? Uh, in finance, we do this all the time. How do we choose between project A and project B? We project the future cash flows and the risks. We look, the, look at the risk adjusted cash flows and we say the one with the greatest net present value, that's the one you invest with. So everything, hiring, I mean, every one of these uh, things, we teach you how to predict better. And that is very, very useful. And not only is it useful to be able to predict, but also for academics to invest in learning to predict better in our research, all of that is very useful. It's just that when I went and studied these expert entrepreneurs, they went the opposite direction. Right? They say the future is fundamentally unpredictable. So let's not even try to predict it. So we have to make decisions without trying to predict the future in the face of an uncertain future. And so uh, they'd say they, they're actually kind of reframing the problem of prediction and control. So how do you control a future that you cannot predict became the question, right? This is, this is like the big philosophical question. And the answer, and I'll give you the answer first, and then we will dive deeper and deeper and deeper into the answer. The answer is very simple. Make control itself your strategy. 
right? So you you work with things that are already within your control. So you're always dividing the world into things within my control, things outside my control. And I don't worry too much about things outside my control. I'm always looking at what is within my control. And then I ask who will work with me and whoever wants to work with me, together we are going to shape the future. We're literally going to build and shape the future. future. We're going to co-create it. Uh, rather than trying to predict it. And how they do that is uh, uh, is effectuation, right? So here we go. Um, uh, so if you take prediction and control, normally we think about prediction, we want to predict the future so that we can control our outcomes, right? So prediction leads to control. So it's almost like a linear uh, thing. But here what they did is they separated it out. They said, if you separate out prediction and control, then you get actually four kinds of strategies. And I urge you to think about this framework a lot, that it's not only about causal and effectual, it's also about the other two. So take a look at this. So high in prediction and high in control is visionary. For a long time, people always thought that successful entrepreneurs are visionaries. They can see something that nobody else can see, or they're passionate and they don't care, you know, that kind of thing. But it turns out that's quite uh, not quite what it is. In recent years, because of technology, a lot of uh, uh, started thinking that entrepreneurs are like adaptive, right? They are very quick on their feet. They're nimble. They'll change as the world changes, you know, and that's what they are good at. Uh, and then this is what we have been talking about causal. Right? Let's try to predict better. Let's get better at predicting the future. Uh, and the last one is effectual, which is low on prediction and high on control, okay? Uh, so there are five uh, principles to effectuation, but let me take a moment. If there is a question that anybody wants to raise, uh, I can uh, take it. I'm going to get to examples and things like that. I'm looking at the chat box. Uh, I'll get to examples, but if there are any questions just on this framework, um, uh, we'll get there because I'm, going, I'm not only going to get an example. We're going to go, remember we started with the answer and we're going to go deeper, deeper, deeper. Um, uh, uh, Taskeen, are there any questions or something or shall I keep going? Question, uh, sir, is my Asif. Yeah. He says that my question is that major criticism on effectuation theory is that there are not so much theoretical evidences ah. that only effectuation ah. can be helpful. Causation ah. is also important. So anything you would like to say. Ah, okay. So um, for, in terms of evidence, there is like tons of evidence, right? <laughs> evidence is not the problem because the original study itself, like, no, I did not come up with a theory and then test it, right? The theory came from the data. Uh, so it is, uh, uh, it was induced from the data. And since then, as I told you, there are hundreds of papers published. I don't think anybody will uh, argue that there is no evidence. There is a lot of empirical evidence uh, for the theory, that's not the issue. But okay. I think if you raise the issue, is effectuation the only thing that is important, then of course that criticism is valid. That's why I'm showing you there are four toolboxes, right? You have to know which condition you're in and which strategy you want to use, right? So you have to know that. But the interesting thing is that in the very early stages of starting a company, what we call entrepreneurial, what I call the zero to 60 miles per hour, uh, you know, the engineering that goes into starting the uh, uh, car, right? When you put the key in, uh, the ignition has to turn on and you have to get it out of the garage. That is very, very different from what it takes to run it on the highway. Um, and when you go to that early stage, at that early stage, everything is uncertain. So you are living in a world which is really, really low on prediction. And the only strategy that works in that, the expert entrepreneurs argue that, now I'm not arguing that, is the effectuation strategy, which is don't worry about all the things that you think you can predict or the things that you cannot predict. Don't worry about any of that. Really only ask yourself what is within your control and you start working with that. So the criticism, uh, if, if there is more question on the criticism, I'm absolutely happy to take uh, uh, more questions. And But I don't think we should ever say that uh, there's only one thing and if you do this, you will succeed, right? If we can get a theory where it says, 
if you do this you will succeed if you don't do this you will fail then there there will be no need for entrepreneurship anymore right that, that means the future is completely predictable um so we'll come back to the uh, criticism shall I, i i'll just keep going for now i hope i answered your question um, uh, to some satisfaction and but i want to make sure i cover enough of the basics and then we can have all the questions uh, that you guys have okay so i'm going to keep going so how does one you know use uh, control as a strategy and for that you have the five principles and since most of you already know this i can go very fast on this one so there are five principles of effectuation uh, i'm just going to tell you the principle first and again we'll go deeper into each one of them so you start with the bird in hand you basically ask yourself what are the, some things within my control who am i what do i know whom do i know and then you invest no more than you can afford to lose so you're not trying to predict the future and say you know what i should uh, invest in a and not b because a is more likely to succeed you don't worry about that you you say even if a fails i want to be able to do it uh, and i am willing to lose x y and z in order to do a so affordable loss and then what do you do uh, based on whatever idea you come up with based on your bird in hand and affordable loss you start building a crazy quilt that is you start talking to people and you're asking you know what can you bring to the table what would it take for you to come on board and you talk to different people and depending on who comes on board if necessary you will change the venture uh, that you're building along the way of course life will throw lemons at you like good and bad things surprises will happen uh and you learn to make lemonade from it uh and uh, the whole uh thing is encompassed in this idea that the future is not given in some way your job is not to figure out what the future will be and place a bet on it your job is to be the pilot in the plane you get to shape the future along with the self selected stakeholders the crazy quill that have come along with you so i'm explaining the principles right now very abstractly now let's go into stories to illustrate each one of these principles so now we'll get into examples so uh the first one i will start with in a in a in interesting way is actually my own and uh, this is an example a very simple example that everybody uh uses uh and for me this is particularly uh important because i actually went through this in my own life in a way so the consider cooking uh let's just think the, let's not worry about ventures and things like that yet just consider cooking uh when you uh cook you can cook causally and uh, can anyone tell me how would you start cooking causally uh some people are saying they're not able to hear should i pause the screen um no the voice is actually clear yeah. yes, the voice is very clear you probably have internet it they're probably having some internet issues or they're sitting in a uh, noisy That's room okay. yeah individuals yeah. might have some yeah. issues all right um when, so you can you see have... in the call already that you start with uh, you start with what do you want to cook you start with the recipe uh you need ingredients and if you don't have certain ingredients you go to the market and get the ingredients hopefully you have the all the utensils and you cook so now think about how you can cook effectually and you can see so you might want to enter how can you cook uh, effectually uh i'm sure you know the answer to that one some people have already uh see what you have right exactly you go into the kitchen you see open the cupboard see what do you have you can look at the garden and see what do you have maybe you can even talk to your neighbors and maybe they want to they have some extra ingredients and you you make something based on what you already have so that is sort of the beginning of the bird in hand principles but now think if you are starting a restaurant so the moment we say i want to start a restaurant you already become causal what happens is then you need a space you need you know tables and chairs maybe maybe you need a chef you need a menu uh you need to do some marketing you need some decor and all of a sudden very quickly say oh i have no money uh so i can't afford to like i don't have uh, real estate i can't afford to rent uh what do i do right uh and that is where the expert entrepreneurs are saying even if you have the money don't go out and like 
buy the uh, place or something like that. Instead, ask yourself, what can you do with things that I already have? And in my case, what I did was I love cooking. Uh, I'm a family, uh, I'm third daughter in a family of three daughters and a son. Everybody in my family cooks. Uh, so my first venture was I know how to cook, uh, but I didn't have money for a restaurant or anything like that. So what I did was I just went downtown Mumbai uh, to a cousin who was working in a big office uh, and I brought lunch, right? And I brought a little bit more lunch. So their friends could also eat and they liked the lunch. And I said, would you like to place an order? Uh, and several people were, okay, once a week, a couple of people said twice a week. And uh, um, I actually started a lunch service. So you don't have to just, because you are dreaming of a restaurant and I was dreaming of a restaurant. Uh, it, it doesn't mean that you have to immediately get, uh, get um, paralyzed because you don't have the money or you don't have the real estate or whatever, or you don't have a professional cooking certificate or anything like that. Uh, just start a lunch service. But the interesting thing was the, I started the lunch service. It started growing a little bit, you know, next people on the next floor, the next building. Uh, and after a while, it grew enough that I didn't, I couldn't actually deliver everything, cook and deliver personally. So I hired somebody to deliver the food. And, uh, and, and then they go and deliver and suddenly um, uh, um, you, you, people start saying the orders start going down. So now I ask the uh, people like, why are the orders going down? And it turns out they say, well, you're a good cook, but you're not that good a cook. But it was kind of interesting when you came in and you're, you're a bit of a cook, right? Uh, and so you suddenly learn something about yourself. It's not really the cooking. I think I'm a cook, but now all of a sudden it turns out that maybe there is something else going on. And so now you think, what else can you do now that you learned something about yourself? And I do this exercise in class and then my students will immediately say, oh, you could start a cooking class, right? You could do a cooking video. And, uh, and that's how a lot of ventures actually come to be, right? So there's some advantage instead of saying my dream is a restaurant and going into the restaurant and then that's all I am stuck with. Be precisely because I don't have the resources and things like that, I have to work with people and then the world teaches me a few things and then all of a sudden, there are seven other things I can do. Uh, and this is just a very simple example, overly simple example. Now let's look at some real ventures uh, and how they were built. Uh, any questions at this point in time? Uh, now, because the next time, go, next thing I'm going to do is to give you a story uh, sort of around each principle. There are no questions as of now, Professor. Okay, I'll, so I'll keep going. So here we go. There is a little thing on my, uh, I don't understand what, okay. So, so the, uh, fr from the research, when you actually looked at the research, uh, the interesting thing is in the cooking example, we are talking about ingredients in the cupboards and things like that. But we are assuming that the person knows how to cook, right? So let's not forget that. Um, when you look at the data, however, from the expert entrepreneurs, they did not even talk about what was in your cupboard. They did not even talk about the resources, the goods that we have. They just talked about these three things. Who are you? What do you know? And whom do you know? They didn't even ask for what do you have? What do you have, they said, is a function of who you are, what you know, and whom you know, right? So the idea is almost anybody, even people with virtually no resources, will still have some personality, things that they enjoy, things that they can, are able to do, things that they're not able to think that they have value systems, they have preferences. Uh, and they have some knowledge. Maybe the only knowledge you have is, you know, uh, how to grow tomatoes or whatever uh, that thing may be. And all of us know other beings because we are born inside a society. And so the idea was this is like the minimal set of things that you have in your uh, bird in hand. So let, let's look at an example here. Like when I click in and out, it goes in and out. Okay. Uh, so this is uh, a, an actual venture called Husk Power Systems. Uh, and uh, I, I, this is particularly dear to me because it was uh, started in India, but there were two uh, Darden students uh, who were also uh, co-founders in this venture. So uh, I know quite a bit about this venture and some of you might have heard of this already. This was in Bihar uh, in India. 
So Gyanesh, who is at the top here, is a founder. He's the engineer. He was in the US and he learned about gasifier technology. And that is how do you take some bio waste and make electricity out of it? And he knew that in his uh, in villages around where he lived uh, in Bihar, there were lots of villages with no electricity, but many of them were producing rice and other grains and the grains have husk, right? And what they did with the husk is they would just kind of throw it on the side of the road. So you have like little mounds of husk and they emit methane, which is very bad for the environment. So he's sitting there in the US and he's thinking, you know what, this sounds pretty cool. I could take that husk and create electricity out of it. And then of course, immediately he starts uh, encountering all the problems with that because these machines are expensive. Uh, and then people said that there are all kinds of government licenses and things you have to worry about. And uh, there is corruption involved. And not only that, if you actually make the electricity, look at the people, they are very poor uh, and they will just steal the electricity and nobody will pay for it. So it will not be profitable. So it looked like this cannot be done. Uh, but luckily for him, he, he went back to India and he literally lives in these villages now. And he used only the materials that were already available in the villages, as you can see. So what you see in the photograph here is not a prototype of a power plant. It is the actual power plant. So they created this little power plant that can create electricity for just 20 houses at a time. They almost invented the idea of a micro grid and there's no grid. It's just 20 houses connected to each of these power plants. They literally trained the people in the village to build the power plant, to maintain it. They trained other people uh, to do the business, things like that. And the two guys at the bottom you see are the Darden students, Manoj and Chip Rensler. Uh, and what Manoj and Chip Rensler did was they wrote a business plan. And here's a funny use of an effectual use of a business plan. They wrote a business plan and then they went into every business plan competition and they would win. And they would get like $5,000 here, $10,000 there. And they even started getting like $50,000 prices. So that's how they, uh, they raised the money uh, in the US. In the meanwhile, Yanish is doing this in the villages. Um, and the, the most interesting thing was, how do you get people to pay? So they started asking, you know, why do we need electricity? Why do you, what, uh, why do people in villages in Bihar really want electricity? Can you guess why they would want electricity? What is the number one use of the electricity? Television. Type that into the chat. TV. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> You're assuming they can actually afford TV. We are, we are talking about people living in villages that have no electricity. Light, internet, charging the mobile phones. That's the number one thing. Why? Because even if you're really poor, you're illiterate, whatever, if you have a mobile phone, you can generate more income. So like I mentioned, even if the only thing you know is to like grow some uh, tomato plants in the backyard and you put all your tomatoes in a basket and carry it on your head and go and sell it in the uh, next uh, village bazaar, the mobile phone will tell you which village to walk to, right? They didn't have that information before and they'll all end up in the same village sometimes. So the idea was the mobile phone allows you to create income. So they didn't want it even for light. Kerosene, is, kerosene lamps are still cheaper. Uh, and so uh, the, the, the number one reason was actually mobile phones. So they decided how do they pay for mobile phones? And it turns out they prepay, right? They get these prepaid cards through which they're able to use the phone. And remember, these are not smartphones. These are feature phones. Um, and so they decided to do exactly that for electricity. So they invented a meter. So in, in these villages, if you're a customer of Husk, you can literally prepay. You can say, I want electric, uh, enough electricity for two mobile phones and you know one sewing machine or whatever it is that you want or two fans or whatever. You prepay it. So somebody will come and literally write down, take the cash from you, and then the meter will uh, start. And, uh, and then um, uh, by the time you're finished using the electricity, the meter will run down and they'll have to come back and recharge the meter. Uh, and that's what they did. And none of this you can sit and imagine somewhere and come up with the business model. You have to be there in the village and you start using the things and you start training people and you work with people and something works and something doesn't work. And you keep working with people who are willing to work with you. 
and then you end up with a business model. Now, a lot of people come to them and they are imitating and learning from them and using it in Haiti and in other places. Uh, that's what is uh, happening here. Okay, I'll keep pressing forward uh, uh, to another story. Now you can see affordable loss. So this one um, is a story. I mean, as I said, they are providing uh, um, uh, electricity to thousands of villages now in Bihar. Uh, the next story I want to share with you is from China. And uh, here is uh, the story of um, uh, Mrs. Zhang Yin. Uh, and she started this uh, paper recycling plant. And if you look at the story, paper recycling plants are quite expensive, actually. So if you look at how she did it, she was working in an import export company. And she started noticing as China was coming out of the Maoist period and the all liberalization was happening and they, uh, they started going into manufacturing in a big way. She noticed that China was beginning to import more and more paper. Uh, and when she looked into it, she found that the paper was actually being used to pack stuff to send to the US. Uh, and so she thought, you know, that all, a lot of the paper is just going into making packaging cartons, right, which are going to the US. And she thought, what is happening to all of that when they, once it goes to the US, and it's very easy to see what happens. They, they just, we just throw stuff away here uh, in the US. So she thinks if I can bring it back and recycle it, because this is only packaging, uh, we can cut import costs a lot. So the question is, how do you build this venture? You have the equivalent of something like 5,000 US dollars. How do you build this venture? And if you look at the story, it's just an amazing story because what she did was she just literally bought a ticket, came to the US, and she started going into like trash companies, uh, literally uh, uh, landfills, and asking people, where can I get a shipping container load of used cartons, right, in decent shape? And, and to her surprise, she found that if she was willing to take a shipping container load of uh, used packaging, there are people who are willing to pay her for it. You know, they were willing to pay her to take away this material. So that was her first pleasant surprise that she had. But then how do you bring it back to China? And here is where affordable loss kicked in, right? She looked at these ships that are going to the US and she realized that they're going filled with all this stuff from China, but they were coming back empty. So she goes and talks to these people uh, who own the shipping containers or who are leasing and literally tells them, you know, it's coming back free anyway, right? Why don't you give me one of those containers to bring these things back? You know, I can't pay you, but I have this idea for a business. Uh, and so for less than five, five, she actually came back with uh, cash flow positive <laughs> because people were paying her to take away the trash and she could get the container back for free. And in China, she worked with small manufacturers who usually are not able to get their packaging material from the importer. So they'll have to go to wholesalers. Uh, so instead, so now the manufacturers that you, she's working with, no manufacturing. So they were able to get together and build the plant. And if you think this story is unusual, there is another story we have on the effectuation.org website which is Richard Branson starting uh, Virgin Atlantic. He basically called Boeing and told Boeing, you know, in a hangar somewhere, I'm sure you have a couple of 747s not making money for you. <laughs> I have a cool idea for uh, an airline. If you let me have the planes, uh, uh, you know, uh, if, they, if, they, if the idea doesn't work out, I'll bring it back to you in the best possible condition I can. But if it works out, you know, let's talk a deal. So the idea is even if you want to start a, a paper recycling plant or uh, an air, airlines company, for somebody somewhere, all the stuff that is important to you is affordable loss. So you can use affordable loss in multiple ways. You can say, I'm not going to invest anything uh, outside of my control. Uh, I can keep the downside un under my control. But you can also make a pitch, an affordable loss pitch, what I call the why not pitch. Uh, you, what have you got to lose by helping me out? Which kind of brings us into the crazy quilt principle. 
But I've been talking a lot. Let me take a deep breath. And if there are any questions or comments, Taskeen, that you want to uh, raise at this question. point, I'll do that. Otherwise, I'll keep telling more stories. <laughs> right, there's one question. It's about can you quantify affordable loans in terms of money and time? Yeah. So the question is, who is you? <laughs> right? Can, can you, when you say, can you quantify every single person can quantify it, but it will be different for every single person. Yeah, right? So I might say I have a full-time job and I have to take care of three kids. So my affordable loss is maybe I will talk to my life partner and for the next year, all nights and weekends, I will work on this venture. And maybe I can take, you know, a uh, uh, couple of lakhs that we have saved and we are going to put it into the venture. Uh, so that could be my affordable loss. Uh, somebody else, maybe they're not married or whatever, they don't have children. They might say, you know, I'm going to take a year off uh, from my work. I'm going to resign. I'm going to try and do this venture. And at the end of the year, if it doesn't work out, I'll get back on the job market. I may not get the same job or as good a salary or whatever, but I'm willing to take that risk. So different people can have very different levels of affordable loss. But you can actually quantify it. That's the whole idea that you're looking the downside in the face and saying, can I live with that? Uh, and so you have to go through that exercise. So that is how it is quantifiable. It's quantifiable only in a subjective way. So you cannot learn, oh, uh, you cannot go to your accountant and ask, what's my affordable loss? Like nobody else can calculate it for you. Uh, except it varies from person to person. Sure. Pardon? Yeah, it varies from person to person, right? Yeah. And not only that, we'll get into the next principle and you'll see very quickly that it's not only your affordable loss, right? It's also the people who are willing to work with you. And that's how affordable loss can accumulate into pretty large quantities. So we'll uh, look at that in a minute. So shall I keep uh, moving, Tashki? Yes, yes. Please go ahead. Okay. So uh, there's uh, one so question. Let's look uh, at the next. Uh, okay. The one person, Addy, is asking, does yeah. luck play a role? Of Does course. luck play a role to benefit entrepreneurs in the form of affordable loss? Yeah, uh, of course. If you are Bill Gates' son, you know, you probably have lots and lots of affordable loss, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, it's not in terms of affordable loss. I wouldn't say that luck is part of affordable loss. Luck is part of your bird in hand, right? Uh, whether you are a poor, illiterate woman in a village somewhere or whether you are like the son of Bill Gates, right? Uh, to some extent, that is, you don't have control over that. Uh, but uh, affordable luck, given that, given that luck, a piece of luck, you can still calculate your affordable loss. Uh, so affordable loss, I think, is not connected with luck. I think, but luck does play a role in many, many different ways. And we will see with the lemonade principle, but even with crazy quilt, there's a certain amount of luck in the sense that this is not predictable. But it is not luck in the sense that uh, either you have luck or you don't have luck because the luck itself changes uh, depending on what you do with it, right? So uh, I can be a poor illiterate woman in a village somewhere and I can just not do anything or I can be a poor illiterate woman uh, in a village somewhere and actually think about what can I do and what else can I do? What can you do and what can we do together? Uh, and and the, the issue is luck is not just a static thing that happens to people. Even when it happens to people, there are all these things that you can do. And if you have many other people in your life, you can do more. And that's, that's the thing. And we look at luck in, inside Crazy Quill. We'll also look at luck in Lemonade. And you can think about luck as a whole when we are finished with the five principles as well. Professor, so, there's just one more question. Yeah, just sure. One more question. It's that with perpetual, with perpetuation, um, you don't know the goal, all right? You figure it out on your way, right? So the question is, how do you determine success if you don't, the success rate of your venture, if you don't know the goal, the end goal yourself? Ah, correct. So, so, uh, so that's a great question and it does require more clarification. It is not that you don't ever have a goal. It says even if you do not have a goal, you can start, right? Even if you don't know. The second thing it says is be willing to change your goal. It's not that you don't have goals. So for example, I want to cook a meal. You can still say it's a goal. 
right? So it's not like you don't have a goal. So let me give you a couple more examples. One of my favorite thing is I asked my, in the early days, I asked students, uh, give me your goal. And then <laughs> Hank goes up and says, I want to make $40 million by the time I'm 40, right? Very precise, very specific, quantified goal. Doesn't tell you anything about what you should do in the mor- when you wake up in the morning, right? Ah, it's a great goal. Like how the heck, you know, what do you do? Uh, another, if you want on the social side, I've had people say, I want to make sure that I save at least a thousand children from hunger and disease and make sure they get education, right? Again, very clear goal, but it doesn't tell you what you should be doing. You still have to ask, okay, what do I do now? But then effectuation comes in and says, okay, now, okay, you want to uh, save children or you want to make a million dollars? Let's think about who are you? What do you know? Whom do you know? Right? So the effectuation can be a toolbox even when you, when you think you have a, a clear goal. But a lot of the time, the, the, what happens is if you take that goal, for example, I want to make $40 million, and then you say collapse it into, therefore, I want to start a restaurant. Now what happens is you have to worry about a place, a chef, a menu, all of that. Whereas with effectuation, it leads you to multiple ways, multiple sub goals uh, that you might not have dreamed about. So the idea is not that you don't have a goal. The idea is be willing to change your goal. Otherwise, you are narrowing down your actions, your possible actions too much. But more importantly, you're narrowing down the other people who will and will not work with you. So the crazy quilt is where you lose out if you're too, because if you're too focused on just a restaurant or like the lunch service and somebody is telling you, you have some other talent that you should put to work, don't do a lunch service, do like education. Uh, you will never come across that if you're too focused on, oh, lunch, uh, lunch, lunch, and cooking, 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 right? So it is an openness to let other people help you shape your goals that gives you the biggest bang for the buck in effectuation. So let's look at crazy quilt here. Askeem, do you think right. I answered the question enough? Yeah, madam, can I ask one question? Of course. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the business in my point of view can be started with the bud in hand. But if we think, uh, if somebody is thinking about affordable loss and this and that, that means he is double-minded. To start any business, to become an entrepreneur, he must be focused on success only, that he will get the profit. If he is thinking on the loss, he cannot, either he cannot start the business. If he start the business, he have double minded. And so uh, mostly people are failed in this way. Yeah. And the second thing, the second thing is when somebody is starting the business, he has only one option that I will be successful. You see many people start business, they grow the business. Then suddenly when they become the experienced person and they think this is affordable loss, this is non-loss and those come after that, they gone into the loss and companies are bankrupt and, but nobody in the beginning, they go on bankrupt. Either they, they, when they lose the business, they go on the job. So yeah. in, in somebody in the beginning, if somebody is thinking about the affordable loss, I don't think he will be successful. He has only a, a, a 50% match. He has already lost in this way. Ah, okay. Uh, so I think uh, that there are like t- at least two different points you're making. I think you are uh, taking affordable loss to mean that I am willing to lose, you know, I will... I will put all the money I have uh, in my savings and you're you're seeing it as risk taking, right? Uh, And that is more likely to happen if you're always focused on the upside. If I believe this idea will make me $2 million, I'm much more likely to take a loan on my house and put the money in that. And then I, if I fail, I lose everything. The experienced entrepreneurs are telling you, don't do that. They're saying, if you decide you are going to put, uh, uh, you know, whatever money, twenty thousand dollars into this venture, ask yourself, what if I lose that? Am I okay with that? Only if I am okay with that, I should do the business. Otherwise, I should not do the business. 
so they're telling the opposite of what you are saying it's not about taking risks uh, it is about saying that this is worth doing even if i lose what i put into it and what i'm going to put into i'm not going to put into it anything more than i can afford to lose so it's about keeping the failure the downside within your control that's what affordable loss is doing now let's look at you should be focused only on success you should not be thinking about loss that is once you have made the decision and you have jumped in and you are starting the venture you are saying you should only be focused on the upside and not the downside and let me uh, convince you that that is not correct either because the number one explanation for success is your willingness to fail and how, what you do when you fail there are you know uh, everybody thinks that either you succeed or you fail that success and failure are like two opposite variables and experienced entrepreneurs will tell you that is just simply not correct in actual fact the way it works is success and failure are very interrelated just like goals and means are very interrelated uh, and so what it, it is like somebody saying that i am going to make only sixes in cricket right that i will never be bowled out if you have that attitude you will not make success so the only way you will be able to make it is if you're willing to risk being bowled out again and again and again but you keep getting better and better and better at hitting the ball right so so one of the things uh, you want to think about it is success and failure are interrelated and if you can keep the failure within your control affordable but you're willing to fail again and again and again and get up and start again that's how you get very good at succeeding at anything so here is the wisdom from the experienced entrepreneurs they will say first of all don't think of failure with a capital f and success with a capital s think of successes and failures and on a daily basis you're going to have a lot of them you have to learn how to accumulate the little successes so it becomes a bigger success and you have to outlive a whole bunch of failures so here is the wisdom when it comes to failures keep them small kill them young don't fail alone uh so you have to have a much deeper understanding of failure and success if you really want to be successful it's not about just focusing on the upside you have to focus on the downside and upside all the time on a daily basis even if you are a very very successful entrepreneur uh you have to um uh, think about both all the time okay can i keep going tech scheme yes please please go ahead okay um and uh, so here we go the crazy quilt principle let me give this story i don't know where these lines are appearing where are they coming from it's completely uh, beyond my understanding so this is gramin bank i just wanted to tell you i mean i am sure uh, most of you have already uh, you already know the story of gramin bank um so mohammed yunus uh, uh, as an economist was working in chittagong right when he noticed uh that people after a natural disaster lost everything and the village where he was collecting data they came to him uh and and he asked how much will it take for you to like restart your little businesses and it was something like a total of 27 dollars worth of money is all they needed to restart like 45 different businesses families uh so like you and me he had compassion so uh he had the money so he gave it to them uh not only they restarted their businesses uh, they actually did when well they came back and they would give him his money back and even like give him a little bit of rice and fish uh and things like that and so he started asking why are why aren't banks doing this and he would go and talk to everybody like we should be doing it but the banks gave all kinds of reasons why they would not that the amount of the loan is too small right the the fees to process the loan is more than the amount of the loan uh stuff like that uh but the story i want to tell you this probably you know already the story i want to tell you is he kept on like building this foundation and non profit organization that was lending money but he was also going to conferences and talking to policy makers and trying to convince them why it should be a bank and there was this uh one conference where in the middle of the conference they shut everything down and had everybody uh they shut the building because there was the army was on the streets and there were riots going on and there was a coup things like that 
And so they were stuck there for the whole day. And that's when he talked to Muhit. And he was telling Muhit, well, basically, basically, basic case, why we should do this. Garmin should be a bank. It should not be just this non-profit foundation. And it turned out that there was a coup in Bangladesh. And the next day, uh, the, the general who had taken over Bangladesh announced Muhit as the new uh, finance minister. <laughs> and because Muhit had spent this time uh, uh, with uh, Muhammad Yunus the previous day, he, had con he was convinced and he figured out a way to make Grameen a bank. So Grameen is a bank only in Bangladesh. No other country has been able to create that because the banks are a very strong lobby everywhere and they won't let uh, microfinance organizations become banks. Uh, so I just wanted to share the story with you that you can call it luck, right? Sometimes the fact that somebody else came in allowed you to do something that you could not even have dreamed. Even when you're going and talking to people, everybody's saying no. Uh, you could call this luck. But the thing is, you have to keep doing that, right? <laughs> luck is not something that happens to somebody when you do nothing. When you're out there and you're arguing and everybody presenting to everybody, talking to everybody, then luck happens because you are basically opening the door for good luck to come in. And that is a crazy quilt principle. Okay, so and uh, people already know. I also think this is a beautiful picture of a crazy quilt, right? There are 8 million women entrepreneurs in Bangladesh and uh, several of their children are doing well. And, you know, uh, uh, and it, it's just an amazing story. All right, so now let's come to the actual luck, right? This can be good luck, but it can also be bad luck. Uh, and this is, I want to share you a story where the entire venture came from bad luck. So uh, Jim Paws was a student at Babson and uh, Jim was very, you know, he was really interested in renewable energy. So he, every, he was working on uh, wind and on tidal and he would write these business plans and he was working with the engineering students and he had all these big dreams and he would go and pitch and every single time he would win the business plan competition, but nobody would give him any funding for actually building the venture. Uh, even though his business plan apparently is very, very good. Uh, and so he gets very disappointed uh, that uh, his venture is not taking off. So one day there's over beer or whatever, he's talking to his uh, engineering friends and he's saying, okay, we have all this money that we have won through the business plan competition. <coughs> what kind of renewable energy company can we start <laughs> with this money, the little bit of money that we have? Because things like wind energy and all these other things cost millions of dollars. So the engineering friend, maybe it was a beer, whatever. They basically say, you know what we should do? We should put slap a solar cell on top of a garbage can and the solar cell will produce enough electricity to compress the garbage so that 20 times the amount of garbage can go into every uh, garbage can, which means the trucks have to come only one in 20 times. That saves gasoline. So they started doing all these calculation and they said, that could be a cool company. And they had everything within their control to build that. So they went and built that. And now they're selling in like 50 in different countries or something like that. I found it hilarious that when I was in Sweden, uh, this is outside Chalmers uh, University uh, of Technology, which is like the premier technology university in Sweden. And outside that building, they, he was exporting Big Belly Solar to Sweden uh, in, in one of their uh, biggest technology uh, universities. So I just found that very funny. But the whole venture, the idea, everything came from the fact that he failed at uh, trying to do what he wanted to do. And now let's come just to the last one. Uh, this is a person I have, a, 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 you know, a, a lot of the stories I'm also like personally uh, in some way connected. So this one is particularly interesting to me. This is Meer Imran. Uh, and Meer said he would actually log on today. I don't know whether he's logged on to the present thing or not. Uh, Meer runs this company called Incube Labs. Uh, he's in uh, California. And what, uh, and he has created a way to put the crazy quilt together in such a way that uh, he, he's able to create medical device companies like that, right? So he's founded over 30 medical device companies and he holds over 400 patents. And it's not just because he's a genius. I mean, he's, he's, he is very smart, right? No doubt about it. But what he's very good at is he has figured out a way to work with a lot of really uh, smart people 
and he has figured out a way to put this so anybody comes up with any idea for any medical device he's got all these people already working with him and they're not employees or anything like that they're all sort of on their own and yet he's figured out a way and they can shape the medical device and then put it through the entire testing system and bring it to market in really uh, in, um, quickly. And uh, so I just wanted to share that with you because it seemed to me like the quintessential idea behind pilot in the plane that they're not waiting to do market research. They don't have to go raise money, whatever. These people are literally shaping new ways to deal with uh, uh, health issues in, a, in, a, in an industry which is full of like regulations and uh, uh, things like that and complicated technologies uh, have to come together. Okay, so I've got, taken you through all five principles. So now it's time to open up for uh, Q&A. And then if we have time, I'll show you a little bit about how it all feeds into a process. But I'd rather spend our, uh, our time uh, taking a few more questions and interacting with you. And uh, I am sure uh, Dr. Shahid and other people later on can walk you through the rest of effectuation. Uh, I hope Shahid, I've done uh, enough of a job. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great, I uh, really appreciate. We'll just take a few more questions. Tahir Hussain Sab is asking that effectuation logic is very interesting and revolutionary, but there are some issues in the way uh, the causal traditional logic is being presented. Okay. So, okay. so I, I, I don't know what does it mean in detail, but maybe they, felt, they feel that uh, because you see they spent four years in undergrad, two years in the MBA program learning uh, spending so much time in learning uh, causation, and now yeah. you see effectuation yeah, yeah, yeah. you learn in hours. Yeah, maybe that is the I don't know. Yeah, I I, I understand. I think I understand because a lot of my students, uh, and this is Tahir. Tahir, you you are like my student, uh, <laughs> and uh, my students have the same issue, right? I'm paying mm. enormous amounts of money to get an MBA, and they're teaching me this stuff. And you are coming and telling me that I have to throw all of that out the window if I am to be a successful entrepreneur. And people just feel a little bit cheated or something, just uncomfortable. Uh, and I want to tell you this, Tahir, that it is not, uh, all of that is not a waste of time. Mm -hmm. It is just, like I said, the engineering that you, that goes into getting your car started and out of the garage, right? It's very different from the engineering for uh, uh, driving the car on the road. But most of your time, you're going to be driving the car on the road and you're going to use causal logic. Remember I showed you the two by two. You're going to use everything. You're going to use visionary persistence. You're going to use adaptation, like being nimble. You're going to do a lot of spreadsheets and planning and NPV calculations and you're going to do all of that. It is just that none of that will help you get the you know the spark in the engine to fly and get it out of the garage so if you want to do entrepreneurship you have to learn this additional toolbox so don't see this as this is opposite to that see the see this as multiple toolboxes and you have to decide what to use when the only beautiful thing about uh, effectuation about the lessons that these entrepreneurs learn is that if you're in doubt as to which quadrant you're in, if you have doubt, you don't know whether the future is predictable or not, you don't know what your passion is, uh, if you don't know, you know uh, uh, the technology changes that you have to adapt to or something, if you don't know, when in doubt, they say go effectual. Because effectual is more likely to reveal which box you're in so that's why they have a strong pro. So it is very good in getting uh, started with a venture, but it's also very good when you are in doubt. So you can never tell me again, I don't have a brilliant idea because effectual entrepreneurs will say, oh, you don't have a brilliant idea. You just need to have some idea based on who you are, what you know, and whom you know, even if it's, you know, yet another little cooking venture, right? Uh, you cannot say, I don't have money because it says you only need to afford what you can lose. And if you can lose zero, that's okay. Zero is your affordable loss. So try to get it done for zero, right? Uh, it's the same way. I don't know. I'm not an influential person. I'm ca coming from a humble family. I, have, I don't have a huge network. Well, effectuation says you don't have to have. Get out there and start talking to people. Ask people. And somebody like Mohit, 
will come in or somebody you will just meet maybe it's somebody sitting next to you uh, on a train somewhere and you talk to them and all of a sudden you can put together this crazy quilt uh, of people right life is throwing lemons at you well you can always even when bad things happen you always ask yourself now what can i do and because you know you get to shape the future so if actuation is telling you things you can do even when you don't quite know uh even if when you don't know which quadrant you're in but the moment you actually start doing something and something a market begins to shape take shape then you can bring in all these other the learnings that you have you can bring in causation you can bring in visionary you can bring in adapt you can bring in all kinds of things uh to build something all right So, I gave a slightly longer answer Dr. just because a lot of students ask this question. Dr. Binish is a professor in Quetta, around like one thousand kilometer. She has okay. been working with us. She says that how effectuation can be used in this scenario, in the COVID scenario, is very uncertain, and it seems that all principles are failing. So I don't know. <laughs> so Absolutely. She, in fact, this is exactly the normal situation for an entrepreneur, right? <laughs> When you really don't know. what is going to happen and what is going to change so the first thing effectuation tells you is the the future is not given right the fact that the future is uncertain means it's an opportunity for you and me to shape that future it's for us to think you cannot do it alone i cannot do it alone but we can actually think what is it that you can do and what can i do and together we can actually shape the future so most effectual entrepreneurs are asking themselves at this point not what i cannot do anymore that i used to do they are asking okay now that this has happened what can i do that i couldn't do before it's like the zoom meeting right i can literally because all of a sudden my time is freed up from uh, traveling uh even though i can i can sit my sit and regret that i am not uh, physically able to go to karachi and enjoy the food enjoy the time with my colleagues things like that but it allows me you know i didn't have to wait till june here it is in uh, april i'm already talking to and i'm talking to many more people probably than i would have been able to talk if i had come physically exactly. to karachi so We even the worst case scenarios have like things you can do even when something very sad happens right uh you literally lose somebody in your family or something goes wrong with, with your child you know throughout human history one reaction is to drown in the sorrow another reaction is to say how do i make this better for other other parents this happened to my child how do i make sure that it never happens to any other child that's a different way of coping with grief and that is effectuation in fact in the us there's organization called mothers against drunk driving the entire organization is one of the most successful uh, social enterprises and they came through this thing that because this woman lost her daughter uh, to lost her child uh, to a drunk driver and she decided i am going to change the world right so the idea is i'm not saying you have to be a hero if equation is giving you a few toolboxes even in the face of really out of control tragedy there are still things that we can do and we can choose to do them and that's the whole idea behind the uh, pilot in the plane principle so as a mother you're asking yourself all the stuff that you cannot do focus on what you can do and think about doing that and working with other people who want to do it with you So there's one mother, a mother entrepreneur. She's asking, "How do we know which idea among all other ideas uh, that is good, which will work? How do you select one? How should you decide what to go with?" Ah, okay. This is a good one. This also gets me into the process a little bit. So let me just take you there. Um, so, so, so what happens here is. You do not ask yourself what is the best idea. <laughs> Let's say you have three ideas. right so you start with who you are what you know and whom you know oops sorry um and you ask yourself can i do this given my current constraints given the amount of time or money or whatever that i'm willing to put into it so the first level is to say how doable is this if it means i have to go raise 50000 and i don't know anybody then don't do that idea right do the idea that is the most doable within your affordable losses within your control 
And then this is day one, right? Day one, you look at your bird in hand and you use your affordable loss. And maybe out of the three ideas, you still have two ideas that is doable. Go act on both of them. Go talk to people, anybody and everybody. You don't have to talk only to this person and not to that person. You talk to anybody and everybody. And the moment you start talking to people, what are you trying to do? You're not trying to gather advice. You're not trying to gather feedback. You're trying to get commitment. You're trying to get them to become part of your venture. What the Americans call skin in the game. You're trying to get people to really do something with you, right? So, so when you start talking to people, what will happen? Some people will say, you know what? So let's say I love this pen example. Let's say my idea is the pen. I go and start talking to people. Maybe I talk to somebody who is a big buyer in a big store and I try to get them. To, I, the moment I start talking to people, people are not going to say just yes or no, right? People are going to say, oh, you're making that pen. Why are you trying to make that pen? Nobody uses pens anymore. Uh, oh my God, you're using plastic. It's very uh, environmentally unfriendly. So people might start saying, you know what you should really do? You should do something that is like a piece of jewelry, which also has some technology. So people will start just giving you ideas and things like that. So at that point in time, what do you do? Some people say, you know, I should just pursue. This is my idea. This is my dream. I should persist in my dream. Other people will say, oh, your customer wants something that is not plastic and something that has technology in it. And maybe it's a jewelry. So that's what you should do. But then, then you have to go and talk to somebody else to raise the money to do it. You don't know. You Maybe you know about pens. It's within your control. But you don't know how to do technology. You don't know how to do environmentally friendly. So you start going and talking to many, many, many different people. And different people will give you different ideas. Somebody says, you know, the color should be different. Somebody says material should be different. A third person says it should not be a pen at all. So you get all this information. And then you try to find out what is the best idea, which is kind of your question. And the effectual entrepreneurs say, don't do any of these things. You can talk to anybody and everybody. And with each person you ask, oh, you, you, you want me to pay, make a piece of jewelry. Okay, what are you willing to invest with me or come do it with me? Or somebody else is saying you should put technology in it. Oh, do you know how to put technology in it? Or do you know someone who is willing to do that for me? And if you are willing to do that, then I will go. So whoever actually puts real skin in the game in your venture, that's the venture you end up doing in the initial stage, right? So you don't sit here and decide or listen to, you know, smart auntie Saras here telling you, here is how you decide this idea is better. This No, go literally talk to anybody and everybody. And the moment somebody says, you know what? I know somebody who can actually build something with uh, environmentally friendly materials. And uh, he has a factory uh, uh, in Brazil and uh, he's actually sort of my best friend from college and I can, okay, then you can do that, right? Because it has become affordable loss for you because that person is going to introduce you and somebody is going to make the prototype for you in environmentally friendly materials. And that is how you make decisions. So if you go back to the process here, every time somebody gives you some kind of commitment, now you have like an expanding cycle of co-created resources. But your idea also changes because they're not investing in your pen per se. Maybe they want a pen made of some other material. That is what they're investing in. And so that also puts some constraints on what you can and cannot do. Along the way, surprises will also come in. Some of them will change your burden hand. Some of them will change your affordable loss. But it is the process, these commitments that come from people that lead you not just to a new product or a new venture, they usually end up leading you to a whole new market that nobody in this, in this process actually imagined. So completely new things are possible. Does that answer the question? And I can just leave the process up. Here. Yes, yes, thank you very much. There is one professor, Bilal from Islamabad, is a PhD in entrepreneurship from Holland. He says that maybe I'm wrong, but I think high-tech innovation are more inclined towards causation theory than effectuation. The huh. window of opportunity huh. spontaneous and short-lived. So can huh. you comment huh. on this? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so I high can give you innovation. example after example after example of high-tech innovation, which has been built effectually. Um, mm. uh, so, uh, so it doesn't have to be, right? Uh, why would a high-tech have to be causal? 
I think the, one of the reasons we think high tech has to be causal is because we think it takes a lot of money. But in actual fact, most high tech ventures, in fact, day before yesterday in my class, I had a Darden alum who built Lending Tree, which is a $4 billion company, publicly traded company at this point in time. Uh, and it was a, a fintech company before there was anything called fintech, right? And Doug Lambda is the name. And he was talking uh, in class about how he was sitting there as a first year student, exactly where my students are sitting right now. And he talked about how he uh, built this company. Nobody would give him any investment. And along the way, and he, uh, and he actually did everything causally. He wrote all these business plans and he would send it out to people. Nobody, until he meets a guy um, uh, from his old uh, uh, university or somebody who knew somebody, and he literally gives up everything. No business plan, no pitch, no. He says, you know, I'm trying to do this venture. What would it take for you to give me a little bit of money and more importantly, credibility. Because if you came on my board as a board member, then the banks will take me seriously because the company he's building is comparing mortgage rates from multiple banks. So he had to make a business that involved banks. It was not only high tech, but it also had to, he also had to deal with these gigantic banks, none of whom would even uh, give him a meeting. Uh, and the way he did this was, the moment you ask somebody, what would it take? And, uh, uh, and that gives me a thing to say, like, how do you ask? How do you get a stakeholder commitment? Uh, and that is this idea. When you are visionary, you're going to tell people, here is why you should invest in my company. That is the traditional pitch, right? Or you say, would you please help me? That's another way. Uh, a third way is to say, well, if you help me, here is, you will get, 10% of the company or 15% of the company, or you'll get this or that and all of those kinds of things. The effectual entrepreneurs just ask, what would it take? What do I need to do? Believe it or not, Steve Jobs did that. That's how he built Apple in the first place. He asked Mike Markula, what do I need to do for you guys to at least take a look at my product? And then Mike Markula, he tells this in a documentary, Mike Markula, who's a, a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley, basically told Steve Jobs, Maybe you should take a shower first <laughs> right? before you come and talk. But the, the funny, that's a funny story. But the thing is, I can give you example after example after example of high tech ventures, uh, which have been started effectually, or sometimes they started causally. And I can show you how and why the entrepreneurs learned the lesson the hard way to do it effectually that it is not about the technology. It's not about the idea. Uh, so I have an entire uh, detailed story of Airbnb, if you want, that I can walk you through. I'll just send that to, uh, to Shahid. Shahid, you can share with them later, the step-by-step -step story of Airbnb, right? Yes, uh, okay. Every single step of the way is effectual. The effectual works, the causal doesn't work. The effectual works, the causal doesn't work. And so they end up uh, being effectual finally. Uh, and then that's how they build the company. So there are hundreds literally of examples are exactly. there companies that start entirely causally sure i'm not saying you can never ever do it that but there is a reason why these expert entrepreneurs are choosing to be effective exactly thanks a lot so we can i i i agree with you i teach a case i link written by babson yeah. and they start with they start with the causal but yeah. they end up effectual yeah. So yeah. it's, it's happening a lot, actually. Correct, correct. There are lots of those cases. And, uh, uh, the, you another can literally same, talk to the entrepreneurs. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah, Umme Athiya coming in again, and she says, have you read Originals by Adam Grant? You know Adam yes, Grant? Yes, of course, of course. I have read your work and his. He focuses on the good times economically, especially transition time, yeah. opportunity and effort, and a mix of a lot more. If you have read his work, can you let me know what you think about his work? I think his work is great. Uh, there are lots of overlaps uh, between his work and mine. It is just that mine is entirely focused on entrepreneurship, right? That's the, okay. that's the primary difference. And plus, uh, I have done a lot of work on the for-profit side in the sense that even if you're doing a social cause, how do you do it in such a way that it becomes financially sustainable so that you don't have to keep asking people for money, right? So I focus a lot because that is the toughest problem. 
how do you solve some of the most difficult problems in the world um, uh, uh, using a structure where it becomes financially uh, sustainable? Uh, kind of the social business idea that Mohammed uh, Yunus talks about. I focus a lot on that. Uh, but but I also can tell you, we've written a lot of cases of companies that start during really, really difficult times, right? A lot of the big pro problems and the big successes, the big solutions and the big successes come out of very, very difficult times. I actually think COVID-19, for example, uh, amazing things are going to come out of this experience that all of us are having. So I see this as like this soil in which opportunities will grow, uh, but the opportunities are grown by actual hands, right? Farmers, planting, so that the entrepreneurs, uh, whether you're a social entrepreneur or a for-profit entrepreneur, you'll be planting the seeds and, uh, and growing them. So, uh, so my, uh, and also there is a very interesting connection between this effectual ask and what Adam Grant has written about in terms of giving, right? The connection between giving and asking. Uh, and right now, I, I'm actually working on a book uh, on the effectual ask, which, uh, which uh, kind of brings together what uh, Adam Grant is doing. So I'll send you a copy of it early if you want. Wonderful. Great. Uh, one of our team member, Abdullah Mustafa, is our team member. He's asking quick questions. Sure. He says you did, you did your PhD with Herbert Simon. What yes. was the best advice you got from him? <laughs> it's a beautiful question. Uh, and I'll share with you two things. One is a process and one is a, a advice, right? Uh, so the process, in terms of process, the thing I learned a lot of, uh, through the process was every single time, I mean, he was, it was, I met him late in his life. So he had the luxury of time, right? In some okay. ways. So, and, and he actually spent every Monday, we would have this meeting one hour, no phone calls, nothing. We would actually have a conversation for, and I, I had that experience with him for six years. And so he would always like lean back and he will say, so Sarah, what do we know today that we did not know the last time we met? <laughs> and, uh, and so the idea is you learn all the time. That means, and it was so difficult to answer, right? As a PhD student, and you're talking to this man who, who literally is in direct touch with every major mind of the 20th century, right? So initially you feel very intimidated, but very quickly you learn, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who he is or who I am. What really matters to him is the new knowledge, right? So, so it is it's not an advice he gave, but the process taught me something oh. about how knowledge works. That knowledge Very is cool. all about the things we do not know, right? It's not about becoming better at the stuff that we already know or trying to know more. It's truly always grappling with what we do not know. So that was kind of implicit advice. The explicit advice that he gave um, was to say, for your dissertation, he said, choose a problem or choose a research question that you are reasonably certain will not be answered in your lifetime. Oh. So think about this. This is kind of an affordable loss. And I tell this to my students all the time, not only my doctoral students, I tell this to my entrepreneur students. I tell them, you know, pick a problem or an idea or something that you're reasonably certain will not make you money. <laughs> Right, <laughs> in some way, <laughs> and think about because the idea here is to choose something that is so much worth doing that even if you fail in it, it's okay, it's worth doing, <laughs> right? So, what Herb was trying to say is uh, choose something that is a difficult problem, and then it's the second piece which is very interesting. The second piece is now you have to make that into little projects, each of which will work. Right. So okay. because you also have to do some research, you have to actually publish something, you have to finish your dissertation, you have to get tenure. So he said the objective function, you should be unafraid and choose something tough, choose something where it is not success that is driving you. It is the value of it that is driving you. But the constraints, Wonderful. you always have to also pay attention to the constraint. Otherwise, you'll not be in the game. So you have to be able to take that large cause, that enterprise, and then you have to turn it into projects that are profitable like tomorrow, right? Uh, and that, that combination, I think, is the most important advice. Wonderful. The second part of the question is, too, I think. <laughs> the second part of the question is, what was your first win that made you confident that you were doing the right thing in this uh, effectuation research? There, there might be a time <laughs> when you said, oh. Uh, 
so uh, well, yeah when it first, the the first set were all not wins right uh, i still remember doing a presentation at wharton and people said ah this might make like a best seller book or something this is not research <laughs> which was very weird uh, because people had a, lo- a lot of they had this feeling that entrepreneurship cannot be studied systematically right uh, then they had all these illusions that it is a statistical artifact because the failure rate is very high which is wrong by the way it's a whole other lecture that i would give you on that um, but the thing is uh, the, there was this feeling that there is nothing there to study right whatever you do is just you're just coming up with like five factors of success or something it is not theory it is not research it is not intellectual uh, so i had a bit of all of that um uh, so one source of strength was that herbert simon was very actively like uh, supportive of the things that i was doing and we would push back he would push back and argue a lot and so just simply being able to answer herb's question and my other uh, advisor lester lave their questions those were all so this is what i mean by the small successes and the small failures right uh, and you keep doing that and then i went to university of washington and then when i started submitting the paper for journals i just got rejection after rejection rejection after rejection and then one of my colleagues literally took me to lunch and he told me sirs you cannot publish this research by telling them it all came from the data forget the data just write theory right write a theory paper because everybody mm-hmm. loves the results nobody cares how you came up with the results which was very strange to me because for me the data was the most important thing but anyway i wrote the theory paper and that got published in academy of management review Uh, yeah. and that's okay that's a big win right so now you know okay you have something but for me having been an entrepreneur that was not enough uh so i did one other thing so the moment the amr paper came out uh i wanted to go and present it to actual entrepreneurs and see what they think and i was in seattle at the time and they organized a a, um, a lecture that i was supposed to give to a bunch of entrepreneurs so i walk in i'm happy i want to share this with entrepreneurs and then 2 minutes before the talk starts this woman who organized it tells me you know what i just want to tell you something uh there are a lot of people who are coming today but half the audience on the left hand side they are all professional ceos who have never started a company and on the right hand side are all these people who are all founders right founding ceos and i was thinking oh my god because at that time i had not done any research on how managers think or anything like that right so i was thinking okay i'm going to present this thing and all the professional ceos are going to say so what is interesting we do exactly the same thing uh why is this about entrepreneurship right so i thought that's what they were going to say uh so i finished the presentation sure enough a hand from the left hand side the uh, the professional ceos one of them raises a hand so i uh, i uh, turn to the men and say yes and that person says you know what now i know why i cannot get along with those bastards across the aisle <laughs> and that's when i knew i have a career because they they did experience different things and they learned different lessons so and then i knew that there is something true this is about entrepreneurship and then thereafter we went and collected data from all kinds of other groups and stuff like that so, so uh, i'm really thankful for that story of success one yes. more, a quick question and then we will be really uh, we i think we broke a record today we went through like 193 participants were there at the peak wow so <laughs> 193 still we have like 156 and um, i really appreciate the people's participation from all over the country and uh, one one question my friend asim husain is from islamabad and he has Sorry. been working with national incubators and the question is that the, our our incubation centers are they trying to follow the silicon valley model yeah and the accelerator model and the vc model so and it's not working that much but still yeah that's very sad because even in silicon valley you only get a success rate of 1 out of 10 right that's very low so, yeah. uh, what is your take on it what shall we do we are opening a lot of incubators in the country spending we are spending like 1 billion pkr yeah uh, on this what shall we do for the policy makers and the so, government and um absolutely so uh, i can give you a quick answer but i will also do a follow on 
So this yes. question came up a lot in several different countries. So different countries are, are actually, for example, in Sweden at Chalmers that I told you, they have literally invented a, a, an a incubator uh, accelerated methodology based on effectuation. And they have shown, I mean, they're actually ranked like number one in the world or something because their rate, uh, the hit rate is so much better. Uh, but I can also introduce you to Prasanna, Shahid met Prasanna, who came from India. And Prasanna has created uh, an accelerator for tech startups, uh, SaaS startups in particular in Bangalore. And he and I worked together closely a lot. And we're literally learning how to build a better uh, methodology for incubators and accelerators. I can definitely introduce you both to Johan Schild in Chalmers and also to Prasanna in Bangalore. But Prasanna's work might be more relevant just because he's doing it in Bangalore and the conditions where you are may be a little bit more, uh, that may be more commonality. Um, and you can definitely, uh, I can definitely introduce you and he can go into details and I can go over in detail too, but uh, definitely there are methodologies being built uh, the iLab at Darden, our own incubator at the university, of course, it's a university incubator. It's not like a Silicon Valley incubator. Uh, they also have developed a program. So if you are in a Western country, uh, there, is a, there are both Sweden and US, there are protocols and programs that they have built based on effectuation that I can bring to bear. And if you are in Pakistan, perhaps the Bangalore example, it might be much more useful and relevant for you. But you can also do like a mix and match and a combo. So I think that thanks a lot, Saras. It's been a great time, a great moment for the entrepreneurship faculty members and students here because we have been talking about effectuation for the past 10 years and your book and your and the book has been used. So, and based on that book, we developed our own cases and we would love to share some of our cases, which maybe if they are good, maybe you can use that in your upcoming book, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I was going to, when I was preparing for this talk, I realized that I do not uh, have any cases from Pakistan. I have a case of a Pakistani entrepreneur in the US, but yes. uh, I don't have, and uh, I would love to have it not only for the book, but also I think, Shahid, we should share it on effectuation.org and maybe at least write up one or two of them as a case from Darden to literally get it published as a case. So people can use it because it's not only people in Pakistan who would be interested, people around the world would be interested in it. Exactly. So if you send me the cases you have written, then I can pick just one or two and maybe we can do a little bit more in depth and offer exactly. that. Exactly. I'm happy. That would be great. That. So my team member Neha and uh, and Ambreen and others, Taskeen and they're, they'll be sharing with you. Ms. Bai will be sharing with you. Okay. And thanks a lot for that. Absolutely. And uh, once again, uh, we, we don't have words to thank you for sparing your time. And I remember the good days. I we spent three days with you in the effectuation conference in Darden, and then we met in Germany as well. And uh, so I would like to thank on behalf of my whole team. My uh, whole team I know you are... have thanked, uh, thank you so much. But as I as we leave, shall I show you like a 90 second video of Steve Jobs? Yes. And you can yes. see he answers these questions about failures, about asking people. Uh, it's just a 90 second video, just so that yes, we yes. end it not on your voice or my voice, but the voice of an actual entrepreneur. Would yes, you like exactly. that? So yes, hold on exactly. one second. I have to just bring it. Yes. This is the advantage of doing it from home. My entire laptop is available. So not oh, only great. what I prepared, but something so that we I We are lucky that we still have around 150 participants. And I'm so thankful to Asim Hussain and many people all over the country. And it's that speaks volumes about that we want to learn, we want to grow, we want to contribute. And effectuation is so close to social entrepreneurship, is so close to our religious and spiritual values, Saras, I can't yes. tell you. The uh, bird it, in hand. Yeah. yeah, you were talking about it uh, earlier on. Uh, Doug Lambda always talks about effectual parenting. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and exactly. And he wants to write a book on effectual life, actually. So uh, here we go. Uh, let me show you. Let me make this big. It's only a 90 second video. Yes, so exactly. here we go. And please show me a thumbs up. Sound, I think you have to check with the sound. Uh, uh, and we have, you have to, when you screen, you have to go back and screen, when you share the screen, click the button sound. You have to go back to the screen share. And there is on the bottom, there's a button to, to PC no. sound. Are you talking to me or someone else? Yes, I'm talking to you, Saras. 
Sorry, but, but, uh, what do you need? Go, go back to screen. Yeah. Uh, share share screen. The video. And, and, uh, and go back to screen share and yeah. then click. And then you will find laptop, uh, desktop, laptop screen. Yeah. And somewhere on the bottom, there, there will be sound. There will be a button called sound. Ah, okay. Hold on, hold on. Because then we will share see. Share computer can... sound. Okay, got yes, it. Yes, exactly. Got it, Click got computer it, got sound it. and then we will see that. We can yeah. hear and see both. Okay. Yeah, you can click it. Yeah. Uh, can you see it now? Uh, if we can, yeah, if we can see it, but uh, you just run it. Yeah, I'll start again. Yes, yeah, start. Now, I've actually always found something uh, to be very true, which is um, most people don't get those experiences because they never ask. Uh, I've never found anybody that didn't want to help me if I asked them for help. I always call them up. I called up, um, this will date me, but I called up Bill Hewlett when I was 12 years old, and he lived in Palo Alto. His number was still in the phone book. And he answered the phone himself. He said, yes? He said, hi, I'm Steve Jobs. I'm 12 years old. I, I'm a, a student in high school, and I want to build a frequency counter. And I was wondering if you had any spare parts I could have. And he laughed, and he, he gave me the spare parts to build this frequency counter, and he gave me a job that summer in Hewlett Packard, working on the assembly line, putting nuts and bolts together on frequency counters. He got me a job in the place that built them. And I was in heaven. And I've never found anyone who said no or hung up the phone when I call, I just asked. And when people ask me, I try to be as responsive, you know, to pay that, that debt of gratitude back. Um, most people never pick up the phone and call, most people never ask, and that's what separates sometimes the people that do things from the people that just dream about them. You gotta, you gotta act, and you've gotta be uh, willing to uh, fail. You've gotta be willing to crash and burn. You know, with people on the phone, with starting a company, with whatever. If you're afraid of failing, uh, you won't get very far. All right. <laughs> so we will be sharing this video to you, a link to you in, in maybe tomorrow, Sarah, so we can circulate. Yeah, sure. I can, I can send you, uh, I think it's on YouTube, but I can literally send you the video if you want. I'll put it up on a, a, yes, a, exactly. a Dropbox or something. You can get it. And, uh, okay. and you know, happy, you happy to much. share anything, you know. Okay. Uh, it's it's a effectuation dot org mentality, right? The whole uh, okay. uh, idea of education is we have to share each other's. Uh, so on behalf of all the men and women, so uh, maybe if somebody can quickly those people who didn't uh, who want to share so that we can know more. Just one more one more minute. Those people. So can I ask? Those, can I ask one question, sir? Okay, quick one, quick one. Shabik yes. Sab is a yes. he makes leather products in Karachi. Okay. He's an entrepreneur and he's excited to ask questions. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Go for thank, it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, madam. Uh, uh, my main question is: Do you think that the bank loan is also a burden in hand? Because when I asked my, this is the supplementary question that I asked previously, because. I mean, my point of view, uh, what you have, that is the bird in hand. But uh, so uh, uh, my previous question, you already know that. So I don't yeah. want to take you much time. But sure. the bank loan, do you think uh, relates to the bird in hand? Yeah. So uh, uh, bank loan is useful if you already have something predictable, right? Uh, in the sense that... Uh, yeah, because when you get a loan from the bank, you're telling them you're going to do X, Y, and Z, right? You're already committing uh, to do something. And that's why they're giving you the loan. But uh, so I'll share with you uh, one of the ways you want to think about it is it is not the loan itself. I mean, always loan is like a bird in hand and you can use it. But remember, you have already promised something for that. So in that sense, it's a little bit more predictive bird in hand than an effectual bird in hand. So, but you know what is truly effectual about it is your relationship with the banker, the person who actually got you through that relationship is where you can together shape the venture. So even if you sign the thing saying, I'm going to use it to buy raw material. And then later on, it turns out what you really need to do is to pay a technologist. Your, your relationship with the banker then makes it effectual because then you can use it to build something 
uh, even when the world changes, right? Uh, under uncertainty. So I always say the loan is a resource. Sure, it's a bird in hand, but it's a bird in hand only in a weak sense. But the relationship with the banker is your real bird in hand. Okay, so with this, uh, I would like to uh, thank all the participants and thank you, Saras, and have a good day. Yeah, and thank you. I've got to go and I've got to teach. So no, <laughs> I'm going to get in 10 minutes. Okay. Thank yeah. you very much and goodbye. Wish right. you the best. Take care.